This is Japan's most notorious tuner. Turbos, coilovers, pistons and rods, HKS made anything and everything in the name of going fast. And in the process, went from two humble men in a shed to one of Japan's most famous tuner brands. But when making just parts for cars wasn't enough, they set out on a journey to build their own supercar, the HKS Zero R. That is, until that plan came to a crashing halt and HKS had to fight to keep it alive. But to understand why they would even want to build this supercar, we need to go back to those two humble men. You see, back in 1973, a young Hiroyuki Hasegawa had just quit his job as an engineer at Yamaha. He was finally going to chase his dreams of opening up a tuning shop of his own. Beside him was his close friend, Goichi Kitagawa. And while both were talented in different ways, the one thing they had in common was that they were broke. So they took some startup capital from Sigma Automotive, an established tuning company that you might know today as SARD or Sigma Advanced Racing Development. So it was Hasegawa, Kitagawa, and Sigma, H-K-S. Now, the startup money they got wasn't much. In fact, they started out in a small shed in the back of a dairy farm at the foothills of Mount Fuji. But this was the humble beginning they needed to start making their plans come to life. What plans, you may ask? Well, the big one was that they were going to create the greatest engine Japan had ever seen. They called the engine the HKS-74E, and well, we don't know much else about it because it never happened. HKS ran out of money before they could finish the build, so they had to pivot. They figured they could earn some money making performance parts, the kind of power adders that manufacturers were too scared to make commercially. And so in less than a year after they were founded, HKS produced and sold the first ever aftermarket turbo kit. The kit was designed for the C110 Skyline, aka the Kenmeri generation, with the L20 inline six engine. And well, the HKS Turbo L20 made 40% more power than stock, pushing the output from 113 to 158 horsepower. The performance was impressive, to say the least, and Skyline owners began buying HKS kits left and right. And less than five years later, cars sold all over the world were trending towards having turbocharged engines from the factory. Proof that HKS was doing something right. They were ahead of the curve when it came to the trends of sports cars. By 1977, they were mass manufacturing turbos for a wide range of cars, and these turbo kits were better than anything Japan had at the time. But how, you might be asking, did Hasagawa and his team even figure out how to make a turbo in the first place? Well, you can thank the Americans for that. Just like how we can thank FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. This is Bob. And Bob's back isn't what it used to be. Bob, your old broken back needs a flexi spot. What's a flexi spot? I'm glad you asked. Flexi spot is the maker of award winning standing desks like the E7 Pro. Your current desk isn't comfortable sitting or standing, but with the E7 Pro standing desk, you can go from as low as 25 inches all the way up to 50.6 inches. So you can always be comfortable no matter how tall you are and no matter how bad your scoliosis is. And even with that beautiful solid core black walnut desktop, the E7 Pro is capable of holding 440 pounds, more than enough for your gaming PC or heck, even your tools. And thanks to its excellent motor and carbon steel frame, the E7 Pro is perfectly stable. So get rid of that old desk, Bob, and click the link in the description to get an E7 Pro standing desk of your own. Wait. This isn't mine? <laughs> of course not, Bob. Security? So don't end up like Bob. Hit the link in the description to up your productivity, invest in your health, and just maybe save your spine with a flexi spot standing desk. You see, America was on top of the turbo game at first, making some of the most reliable turbocharged cars. So HKS bought some American made turbos and reverse engineered them to make their own. A little ironic considering most of HKS turbos now are made by Garrett, an American company. But anyways, back in 1981, HKS took these newly made turbos and expanded to the USA. And even though overnight parts from Japan sounds cool, overnight parts from Japan were expensive. So HKS did something that 
many of their competitors couldn't, and they stocked their parts in the USA to sell to North America. And that was huge, because that move is what led them to be able to expand their parts catalog even more. Piggyback, FCON, ECUs, twin power ignition systems, turbo timers, VPCs, anything and everything that made your car better. HKS was now a full-blown tuning company. But there was one obvious caveat to the HKS story at this time. Unlike many of their competitors, they didn't have any famous shop cars to back up their product. It may sound a little unimportant, but every big tuning shop had a car of their own with every single part they made bolted to it trying to break records and win races. That was the only way to virally market yourself at the time, and well, HKS realized this a bit late. For HKS though, it was fine, because their product line was not only extensive, but it was super popular. And they knew they could build something badass out the gate. So in the early 80s, they introduced the HKS M300, an in-house modified Toyota Celica Double X. And with the full catalog of HKS parts, that Celica hit 301.25 kilometers an hour at the famous Yatabe Max Speed Event, being the first Japanese car ever to exceed 300 Ks. This was a huge achievement, one that gave HKS recognition around the globe. But along with that recognition came some expectation. If HKS was that good at building street cars, then surely they could compete on track. And well, HKS agreed. It was time to enter motorsports. They started with rally and drag racing. HKS developed the 134E, an engine that started with a Mitsubishi G54 engine block and then used in-house HKS parts for everything else. That engine raced under the Rally Art brand for Mitsubishi and it was pretty decent, which you can learn about by watching our Lancer Evo video linked below, right under the link to buy our latest Albon merch, by the way. Anyways, by the mid 80s, HKS's growing catalog was creating huge demand and they were opening up factories just to keep up. In fact, HKS was selling so many exhausts that one entire factory was dedicated to making just that. And before it was HKS carbon titaniums on every Mark IV Supra, their exhausts were named aluminum muffler, riding sport muffler, turbo muffler, or my favorite, legal muffler, depending on your preference or car application. But oddly translated names aside, these HKS exhausts were the absolute hotness, and they were selling out quick. And if top speed runs and rallying weren't enough for the race fans, HKS decided to enter into grip racing, specifically the Grand Champion Series at Fuji in Japan. HKS used this series as an experiment to study five valve engines, namely their 186E, a two liter dual overhead cam four cylinder based on BMW's M12. These guys were straight up mad scientists, and once they mastered the intricacies of that engine, they said, F it let's race some motorcycles. So they then developed the HKS 200E, a 600cc dual overhead cam two cylinder motorcycle engine. And that engine was so good that not long after every single motorbike on Japanese paddocks had a 200E in it. But not satisfied yet, they went back to drag racing and built their legendary HKS Mark III Toyota Supra, a car that broke a long-standing obstacle in Japan, the eight second quarter mile. That Supra made 826 horsepower through its 7M engine. In 1990, HKS had their hands in absolutely every aspect of motorsports. And if there was a JDM sports car on the market, HKS was making it go faster. And the face of JDM sports cars at the time was Godzilla, the R32 Skyline GTR. The R32 was a beast in its own right. The legendary RB26, a Tessa all-wheel drive, and an ever-growing list of championship wins under its belt. It only made sense that HKS would use the GTR as a canvas to go fast, but there was more to it than that. Remember how HKS initially set out to build the ultimate engine? Well, they had built so many fantastic engines since the days of the dairy farm that it would be marketed as an H. HKS manufactured car, not a Nissan. But that also meant HKS would need to follow Japanese auto manufacturing laws. And that meant they would have to crash test a number of zero Rs and then pass a rigorous inspection. And well, crashing cars that you hand built with custom parts is expensive. So expensive that, well, just like that very first engine they set out to build, they had to take a step back 
from the Zero R. They did build a few of them, 10 to be precise, but there was no way to massage the budget enough to get them crash tested. So begrudgingly, they were forced to shelve the Zero R project for now. And HKS was left wondering what they could do to grow the company enough to bring the Zero R project back online. The aftermarket parts business was growing at a steady pace and on the motorsports side, they had already done top speed runs, drag racing, rally racing, and grip racing. What was even left for them to test their engineering? limits. All right, Formula One. Yes, in 1992, HKS started developing F1 engines, screaming V12s that revved to 13 and a half thousand RPM and made 670 horsepower. Well, kind of. To be totally transparent, HKS didn't see much success and their engines never actually raced, but their engines were fully tested and developed Formula One spec engines. And the R&D that went into that project was one that was invaluable to helping development across their product line. Hell, it was even enough for them to compete and be competitive in Formula 3. But all that aside, if I'm being honest, there was something much cooler than F1. A race series that was indigenous to Japan and featured all of my favorite car. 90s Japanese touring car racing. And HKS was involved in every step of it. JTC was Japan's top racing series. We did a video on it linked below. But to compete in JTC and win was to say that you had one of the best cars in Japan. And for HKS, well, that was their goal from the very beginning. So they grabbed an R32 Skyline and poured all of their tuning expertise into it within the Group A regulations, of course. But those Group A regulations were super strict. Engine blocks, heads, cranks, rods, turbos, all of it had to be the factory delivered parts. And with the grid full of GTRs all running the same Nismo derived Rainic RB26 engines, HKS HKS didn't have much room for tuning. HKS was an engine builder after all, they had expertise that much of the grid did not. So instead of replacing parts, they tuned them. The engine internals were lightened and balanced. The block was carefully machined for lightness. Even the blades on the turbo were cut to flow better. Hell, even the oil they used was specially formulated. They called it O87 and it was like vegetable oil. So thin that there was minimal friction and it had to be replaced every single time they ran the engine. You see, this was the magic of HKS. They were the tuners that would go above and beyond to create a better product than all of their competitors. And the result, a green and orange Godzilla, one with an engine that made just enough horsepower to be the fastest on the grid. Enough horsepower to take first place at Sugo in 1992. Now, the rest of the season was kinda eh, but the next year, when they came back to race, they dropped the old livery and went with a new design. It was still orange and green, but now with a little blue and black in the design that they had printed on their 087 oil can. They called it the oil spill livery. And it was from here that this design became synonymous with JDM tuning around the world. Now, beyond JTC, HKS also built yet another R32 GTR for the drag strip. Well, that GTR won every single series that it entered extending Godzilla's dominance to the drag racing scene as well. And by the mid 90s, HKS was consistently placing third in Formula 3 races, proving that the Formula stint was at least a bit worthwhile. And also the HKS livery on a Formula car, it doesn't get cooler than that. Or maybe it does, because HKS then entered the Motorcycle World Endurance Championship and they were in British Formula 3. And oh right, they also made an ultralight Plane engine. At this point, HKS was leaving their mark anywhere that had staging lights. All while their products were still flying off assembly lines and into tuner cars around the globe. It was success beyond their wildest dreams and yet we still haven't gotten to the good stuff. Cause in 2000, HKS introduced a new monster, the HKS Alteza. This was important because it was a huge stepping stone to proving that the Zero R was still viable. This was a race car based off the Alteza, but designed from the ground up by HKS with only one purpose in mind, to break the record at Scuba. It was fully built, every suspension and chassis part you could dream of, and it may have had the 3S GE that it came with from the factory, but HKS threw every part they had at it. The end product was an Alteza that was so fast that it set a 55.853 second lap time at Scuba, beating out supercars and long-standing race car records at the time. They followed up that performance by entering the HKS Hyper Sylvia into D1 Grand Prix in 2002, finally adding drifting to their resume. And then there was the TRB02, a fully built HKS Evo 8 that did 55 flat at Scuba, setting another record, only to beat itself again the next year with a 54.7. 
739. And from there, they built another Alteza that did second place in the D1 Grand Prix. At this point, HKS might have caught a murder case with how much they were killing it on track. And as you can imagine, their parts catalog was no different. Every 350Z at Tokyo Auto Salon had the new HKS supercharger that hit the scene immediately after the Z's release. Every Mitsubitsu had to have the HKS Hypermax coilovers thanks to the Hypermax Evo 9 dominating time attack in 06. A car that was doing sub 54s at Scuba while setting records at Sugo, Fuji, and circuits all over Japan. And eventually, all this success culminated in the one thing they had been waiting nearly two decades for. They grew the company, and along with that, grew their budget, which meant enough was enough. It was time to finally finish the HKS Zero R. Luckily for them, automotive regulations in Japan were much more lenient now than they were in the early 90s. Japan no longer required crash testing to be done for homologation cars. And this meant that HKS wouldn't have to spend the $145,000 per car just to destroy them. So they pulled the HKS Zero R's out of storage, all 10 of them to be exact, but there were only about four worth saving and finishing. And as soon as JDM enthusiasts caught a whiff that the Zero R was being brought back to life, they were lining down the block to buy one. But there was a problem. The car was too dated now. This was an R32 Skyline that they had designed nearly 20 years ago, and HKS wouldn't be caught dead putting out old products. Not with all of the new knowledge they gained from motorsports and R&D over the last couple decades. So the original Zero R made 450 horsepower and 363 pound-feet of torque, respectable numbers for the early 90s, but that wasn't going to cut it in this day and age. So the ancient TO4E turbo was ripped out along with the 2.7 liter stroker engine, and in its place was a new Nismo block from the JGTC race cars and the very sought after HKS stroker kit that took the RB26 up to 2.8 liters. Plus they upped the compression, threw in their in-house variable valve timing system, and then finally added a couple HKS GT2530 turbos to the equation. All that made it to a modified Getrag six-speed manual. They even pulled out the back seats and moved the fuel tank just so they could build a custom and very intricate twin exhaust system. When it was all said and done, the final numbers were 600 horsepower and 477 pound-feet, much more in line with what HKS was known for. And of the four Zero R's that were made, one was sold to the Sultan of Brunei to a car collection the public will probably never see, and the other three weren't actually sold. They were put on display at the HKS factory, a trophy that symbolized all of the work they had put in over the last 30 years. Well, that is, until a few years ago, when the number three Zero R popped up in the wild at auction. The car sold at the 2019 Tokyo Auto Salon auction for what was nearly $400,000. I'm not sure who bought it or where it went, but just like with the Sultan's car, we probably won't ever see it in the wild. And that's a shame, given HKS's history of building some of the most badass cars on the planet. But even the fact that this car exists is something to celebrate. HKS finally managed to build the car they had dreamed of building, and in the process, they grew into one of the most impressive tuning houses in the world. And as for HKS's history after the Zero R, well, it certainly didn't stop there. Hell, it never stopped at all. They continued selling their now even more extensive catalog of parts for nearly every Japanese tuner car and have since expanded to European and American cars as well. In 2010, HKS introduced a new proprietary line of turbos, the HKS GT2. And for some cars like the Lancer Evo, it was a true bolt-on upgrade mating right to the factory manifold. It was OEM quality and fitment that very few other tuners could achieve, and for HKS, that was the reputation on which they built their brand. But just as things were getting good, the economy in America was taking a turn. The exchange rate to the yen was deteriorating, and that meant that in 2011, HKS announced that they were closing down their US facility. It was a huge blow to their business, probably the biggest setback they had faced in their entire history. And honestly, it was indicative of a larger trend in the industry. Japanese tuning houses were struggling to make ends meet. Trust, one of HKS's biggest competitors, filed for bankruptcy years earlier. And HKS's then chairman, Jun Toyota, even said that he didn't foresee any new Japanese tuning companies rising to the heights that they once occupied. Times had changed, and the only way to stay relevant was to adapt. 
which meant cutting costs and shifting their focus to the emerging Indian and Chinese market. But despite all those setbacks, HKS hung on, and slowly but surely they built the company back up, even re-establishing their US operations in 2017. They stayed committed to drifting, time attack, and even the occasional jet ski race. And as for Hiroyuki Hasegawa, the founder of HKS, he remained an integral part of the HKS story until his passing in 2016. One of the visionaries that pioneered an entire car movement, one who saw a car as a blank canvas that could always be improved. All from his humble little shed and his undying love for cars. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, you'll love our video on the rise and fall of the Lancer Evo. Don't forget to subscribe and support us by getting our merch linked below or by becoming a patron or member. I'll see you in the next one.